So, uh, an enormous pleasure for me to visit Lund. I've never been here before, and of course it's famous in many ways, but particularly for its work connecting stem cells and neural development. So I'm particularly pleased to be so kindly invited to stop here uh, after a week of extensive entertainment and uh, activities. Uh, one is kept up quite late at night, so I hope I manage to be somewhat coherent in what I say. <clears throat> so the title of this talk um, relates to the fact that there is a continuous interaction between the egg, the cytoplasm of an egg, and a nucleus which enters it, whether it's by fertilization or nuclear transfer. And this interaction, as you will see, involves the egg trying to achieve one thing and the nucleus of a somatic cell trying not to be changed. So I call it a, a battle between the two. And that's meant to be the theme uh, of this talk. So the, the, the uh, design of the talk is to give you a little bit of background. You may say that's boring. On the other hand, there are a few lessons to be learnt uh, about uh, how, how things progress. And then I will talk about how the egg is trying its best to convert a somatic nucleus back to pluripotency. <coughs> and that will be followed by, I think in a way, one of the most interesting aspects of the field, <coughs> which is that the, <coughs> the nucleus of a somatic cell particularly doesn't like to be made to be reversed. It resists it extensively. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about the, the prospects for this, uh, this field. Oh, now I've gone backwards. Right, now it's going forwards. Right, so I always think that when you start a piece of research, you always need a question. Uh, because if you don't have a question, you don't know in which direction you're trying to go. So when I started my work, um, there was this fundamental question of the time. And that question was whether all cells of the body do or do not have the same sets of genes may be hard for you to imagine a time when we never knew that, but in the 1950s, before DNA had really been brought to light, that was a relevant question. And so that is the, <clears throat> the question I started with. And the field effectively started with Robert Briggs and Thomas King. Um, they were working in Philadelphia in the early 1950s, and they were the first to discover that you could transplant a living nucleus from a cell into another cell, in this case the egg, and obtain uh, <coughs> normal development, at least up to a point. And when they did these experiments, they found <coughs> that when they transplanted a nucleus from a very early embryo cell, the success rate was quite good. Something like most of those embryos they got developed quite well, but the major result, in a way, was that as soon as they took a nucleus from a more specialized cell, not very specialized, the, these are embryo cells, they call them a neural stage or tail bud stage, uh, the, they no longer got any normal development. <coughs> and the conclusion from that, which they drew, and I would have too if, it, if I'd been doing their experiments, was that there is something happens as cells differentiate which makes the nucleus unable to be reprogrammed or uh, participate <coughs> in normal <coughs> development, whether that was a loss of a gene or whether it was the, some permanent inactivation of the gene wasn't clear, but that was the result they got. So I was then encouraged by my supervisor to start work in this field. Um, you might say it's bad advice to start doing an experiment when the answer is already known. But the fact is that we couldn't be sure whether that was the correct conclusion or not. And even if it was, 
<coughs> the very important further question was how does um, how does this happen? What is the mechanism of these uh, nuclear transfer experiments? So <coughs> I started this work, and this is just to summarize the design of experiment in these sorts of this kind of work. Uh, you start with a somatic cell, let's say skin, separate the cells, and then you suck a cell into a micro pipette, micro needle, such that the cell is broken, but the nucleus remains intact. And that is then transferred <coughs> into an egg whose own chromosomes have been removed, unfertilized egg. And in some cases, this can form a frog. And nowadays, the same procedure works quite well with most of the kinds of mammals which have been tested. <coughs> this is the first frog that I was able, able to obtain. Um, we now call it cloning, but at the time it was always called nuclear transfer. And the important point <coughs> is that this frog was entirely normal. Um, it lived for about 20 years, and it had about 5,000 offspring, and that's about as well as frogs ever do. So it was a, a frog of a good quality. And people sometimes say that when you clone animals, all you do is get abnormalities. It's simply not necessarily true. <coughs> so a key event in this whole work was the, uh, the use of a genetic marker. You can imagine that if you transplant a nucleus from a somatic cell to an egg that has no, should have no chromosomes of its own, you have to prove that the embryos that you obtain did in fact arise from the uh, activity of the transplanted nucleus. And so one needed a genetic marker. And <coughs> I give my supervisor great credit for having discovered one just at the critical time. And at that time, we used one, a nucleola marker. <coughs> the, um, this involved, as it later turned out, to be a deletion of ribosomal genes. Uh, there are a, um, a set of ribosomal genes on each chromosome set in Xenopus, many other animals. And in the normal wild-type animal, uh, you can, hope you can see, this is a set of cells and mostly nuclei. That, that's a nucleus and that's a nucleus. And most of these, which hardly show, have two nucleoli in each nucleus. There's one there. For some reason, they're very dark here, but if, if you will have to imagine that uh, in these nuclei, there are two, generally two spots. And the spot is the nucleolus, the site of ribosome formation. Now, in the, <coughs> in the uh, mutant heterozygous form, there's only one. You can see these more easily. There's one there, one there, one there. And I'm sorry that the two nucleated ones are just not showing very well. But it doesn't really matter. The, the fact is you could transplant a nucleus from the one nucleolated strain into eggs provided by the two nucleolated strain, and then you take a few cells of the embryos, squash them, and see whether they carry the genetic marker or not. And that was crucial in the early days of, this, of these experiments. <coughs> when one did that with uh, Xenopus, the Xenopus frog, um, the results were significantly different from those obtained with the American work, which was with Rana. So uh, the, in each case, as you transplant a nucleus from a more specialized cell, the success rate goes down. So I'm measuring success by how often you get feeding tadpoles from a nuclear transplant experiment. As I said, Briggs and King found they didn't get any we did get some, less, but we nevertheless got some. And so that did open the question of whether there really is any stable irreversibility of the transplanted nuclei. So the key question then was what happens when you use truly specialized cells? And in this case, we're using the intestine of a feeding larva 
Um, it's, uh, these are the intestinal epithelium cells, and they are used to, uh, for feeding purposes. And you can transplant nuclei from those cells. When you do that, <coughs> most often, you get very abnormal embryos. This is an early embryo from such a nuclear transplant. And what you need to know is that these cells at the top are pretty normal cells of an early embryo. But down here, there is no division. The, the egg is just undivided. <clears throat> and that embryo will die unless you do one of two things. You can either take these cells, separate them, and re-transplant a nucleus again from those into another set of eggs, at which point development uh, is often normal. These, these uh, originally transplanted nuclei have to uh, re reaccommodate their cell cycle rate. And when you do a serial nuclear transfer, that is in effect achieved. Or you can take those normal cells and graft them onto a host. Uh, there's a graft, and these cells come from the GFP marked intestinal epithelium cells. And when you do that, you can get uh, normal larvae, and the green bars are muscle cells. Um, each one is a single muscle cell, as happens in the larval tail. <clears throat> and these are derived from the nucleus of the uh, intestine cell. The black areas are actually uh, muscle cells of the host. So the, 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 the intestine-derived ones are nicely intermixed with those uh, from the host. So adding this up, to summarize this background, <coughs> it says that about a third of all the nuclear transplants from intestine nuclei will give uh, cells of an entirely unrelated kind, like we're talking here of the switch from intestine epithelium to functional muscle or nerve. Uh, it's a major switch in cell type. And the overall effect is that about a third of these nuclear transplants uh, work that way. So there is a fair degree of reprogramming in that the egg is able to switch the expression of the intestine cell genes back to uh, an entirely unrelated kind. On the other hand, uh, about 70% do not. And this reflects this kind of conflict. The egg is successful in reprogramming about a third of the nuclei, but the other two thirds show this resistance. They are not able to be reprogrammed by the egg cytoplasm. <clears throat> And I just, in passing, I mentioned clones because um, as scientists, we're rather uninterested in a clone. All a clone in is, is a set of identical twins, just like you might have among humans. But the, the, the media are very interested in clones. And this was one of our early clones using an albino donor into eggs of the wild type female. The reason they're all small is that they're males and uh, they um, they are truly identical twins because you can graft skin between them without any, any problem. And then, in the course of time, uh, Wilmot and Campbell were able to make the procedure work with mammals. Uh, it's quite an interesting question as to why there was a gap of 40 years between the early amphibian work and the successful mammalian work. And part of the reason for that is that some people published a paper um, in the 19, about 1980 actually concluding that nuclear transfer in mammals was impossible. So people didn't try all that hard. And you might wonder why they said it was impossible. And that was because the experiments they did did not succeed. Why did they not succeed? And the main explanation is that they were using fertilized eggs as recipients. We always used unfertilized eggs. And you have a problem that when you use a fertilized egg, it has already started committing itself to development, and it will not accept um, another nucleus from another source. So the 
the moral of the story perhaps is that when you uh, repeat, try, when you to do another, try to repeat an experiment, you should actually do it exactly right. N don't vary something. First, try to exactly copy what was done, and uh, then it actually works. And the dolly the sheep was an example of how that worked successfully. <coughs> And just to summarize, the uh, work with amphibian mammals is extraordinarily similar. So again, this shows the, that when you start with a, a nucleus of an embryo cell, whether, it's, whether you're judging this by mammalian nuclear transfers that reach birth or xenopus nuclear transfers that reach a feeding tadpole stage, the results are about the same. There is reprogramming. On the other hand, there's very considerable resistance. As cells differentiate, their nuclei uh, become increasingly reluctant to be made to change. So now let me uh, <coughs> mention an experiment which I really like. It was done by James Byrne, actually a student of mine, but he did this work after he'd moved on from our lab. and it, illustrates how, these, how this method can be used. So he started with a monkey, uh, assumption being, I think, correctly, that if something works with a monkey, it probably would work with a human if you were allowed to do it. So he had the monkey, took a skin, uh, transplanted the nucleus to an egg of a, uh, of a monkey. It has to be the same species. You can't do these experiments across species. And then that nuclear transfer step or cloning step generated the mammalian embryo from which the inner cell mass cells um, amazingly can be turned into the famous embryonic stem cells. Uh, absolutely amazing discovery of Martin Evans. And, and these, these cells have proved immensely valuable for all sorts of purposes. So once you have these permanently proliferating embryonic stem cells, which, however, can be switched into any kind of differentiation pathway you like, whether it's nerve or muscle. Uh, you can take these cells, proliferate them, and then you can add, take some of these cells and add what I call factors, which are usually things like TGF-beta or FGF, one of the known growth factors at the appropriate concentration, and then you can derive uh, beating heart muscle uh, from the skin, and if this machine will uh, work, uh, we should be able to show this. It's uh, very, oh, it has worked, yes. This is the, these are the beating cardiomyocytes, uh, several thousand of them beating, and they are, of course, all derived from the monkey skin and uh, has another view in another group of them beating in time. <coughs> now that uh, is, is an amazing result, but, and the problem with it is that if you now transplant that group of cells directly into a host heart, it will not, they will not integrate as things are at present with the rhythm of the host heart. It's a step, you might think that shouldn't be so difficult, but it, at present that is a, a real problem. There must be a solution to it, but it hasn't yet been solved. And uh, it's remarkable that the whole process of going from skin to cardiomyocytes works fine, but it's the integration into the host that seems to limit success at this time. Now I'll say a word or two about epigenetic memory uh, and this, uh, gone backwards. Uh, the design of experiment is this. It's it's a really interesting phenomenon, and it illustrates the resistance of somatic nuclei to being reprogrammed. So in this experiment, we start with a, a tadpole, take a muscle cell, transplant its nucleus to an egg, and then grow the egg to an embryo, and then <coughs> separate the embryo into that part which will form the nervous system and the skin, or the other end of it which will form endoderm and gut. And the surprising result is that uh, many of these cells, even though they're not muscle, will express muscle genes to a high extent, something like 
50% of these cells are now overexpressing muscle genes, even though they are part of the neuro neural skin lineage, and likewise endoderm. So that, that memory of where the transplanted nucleus came from uh, persists through multiple, uh, sta multiple rounds of cell division and is still remembered when transcription starts up again. So to cut a long story short, um, this turned out to be largely explained by the presence of a variant histone called histone H3.3, which is present in eggs. <coughs> and it's this histone which causes a nucleus to continue to express those genes that it was expressing before nuclear transfer. And you can test that by overexpressing in this egg a mutant form of histone H3.3, um, in which a, uh, you, you've used a glutamine instead of uh, methylatable lysine. And this now uh, overrides the endogenous histone H3.3. So this egg has no H3.3, and the memory which was working at about 50%, virtually disappears. And that, um, again, illustrates the resi resistance of a somatic nucleus to be completely changed. Uh, the egg is doing its best in this conflict to switch it back. And in some cases, it does that. But in other cases, it can't, um, uh, can't achieve that. And the nucleus manages to remember where it was for several divisions. So in summary, then, the epigenetic memory is explained because of this very high content of H histone H3.3 um, causing a continuation of active genes which would not arise if it was just fertilization, because sperm don't have active genes. And then the other conclusion is that the egg cytoplasm reverses the gene transcription pattern with about a 50% of efficiency. <coughs> so now the question is uh, whether one can analyze this situation a bit further. And I need to um, explain why we needed to do that. Uh, um, and this is because when you do the experiment that I've just described, uh, there is this phase after nuclear transfer, a very intense replication, about 12 rapid cycles of cell division before the embryo starts to transcribe genes. That's the standard experiment I've just described so far. But the main problem is that the incomplete DNA replication damages somatic, somatic nuclei. They can't adjust quick enough to this rapid division cycle of the egg, and that causes loss of chromosomes and confuses the whole analysis of the experiment, because we're really interested in how transcriptional reprogramming occurs, not replication. <coughs> to get around that, one uses a, an egg progenitor cell, and this is called the oocyte. It's the growing egg cell, and, and these growing oocytes uh, have a very large nucleus, which is called a germinal vesicle. You can transplant multiple nuclei into that germinal vesicle, and then the oocyte undergoes intense transcription with no DNA replication, and a few days later, these very same nuclei have now been switched to express express pluripotency genes. So the reprogramming is happening conveniently without any confusion of DNA replication, and you end up with uh, the new pattern, reprogrammed pattern of gene expression being evident. This is because in this species, the growth of the egg, start with, you start with the germ cell, and it takes an enormous time to gradually build up this oocyte. And once that's happened, <coughs> it switches in a matter of a few hours. Oocyte becomes an egg, the egg is fertilized or receives transplanted nuclei, and cells start to embark on their different, different pathways. So the oocyte <coughs> has this special capacity of building up an enormous supply 
of developmentally important components, and these are, uh, uh, they will be in a moment, <laughs> illustrated in the next diagram. This just shows you the, the progenitor oocyte, a large cell, and the germinal vesicle, which we're interested in, lives in there. You can't see it, but if you take it out, it looks, you can hardly see it on this projection. It's a large vesicle there. Um, and <clears throat> this germinal vesicle contains this reserve of developmentally important components, uh, which uh, are able to reprogram nuclei. So when you transplant nuclei into this germinal vesicle, the pluripotency genes, SOX, OCT, and NANOG, for example, are very rapidly switched on if you use dividing cells, and mammal cells work perfectly well, or if you use differentiated cells like the thymus, it takes a great deal longer. Again, reflecting the way the, as differentiation occurs, cells resist this reprogramming activity of the egg or oocyte. So this, I call this a transcription assay, because you can transplant nuclei into the germinal vesicle, and uh, it's, it's extremely useful for testing transcription. So for example, uh, multiple nuclei are injected into oocytes, so you have enough material. Uh, there's a linear accumulation of new transcripts, Multiple initiations of transcription occur. Those of you who work on tr transcription will know that it's very Im really impossible to take an extract of an egg and incubate isolated nuclei in it. Transcription will run to the end, but it won't start again. In this in vivo experiments, you put nuclei into a living cell. The transcription on each gene is repeated multiple times, many hundred times a day. And these oocyte injections show the resistance that we're interested in. <clears throat> so now let me uh, turn to the question of the transcriptional activation. This is to be seen as the egg cytoplasm with its components, as I put it, attacking the somatic nucleus, trying to make it switch back in development, much as the egg does that with sperm. Sperm is an extremely specialized cell that has to be dramatically switched into a new pattern of transcription, and the egg is trying to do that. And so how does it do it? First thing is that it causes a massive decondensation of the nucleus or chromatin, so that's a typical sperm nucleus, and after nuclear transfer to the egg or after fertilization, this little nucleus it develops into this enormous structure there uh, within a matter of hours. And this is to be seen as a decondensation of chromatin. So the compacted chromatin with switched off genes in, the somatic, in a somatic cell or in a fertilized in a sperm is opened up and genes become accessible. Now that same process happens when you transplant nuclei. These are somatic nuclei transplanted to the uh, germinal vesicle, and after a short while, each of these becomes enlarged to these huge vesicles. Each of these is the expanded nucleus, and that reflects this decondensing activity of the egg or oocyte. You can see this happen rather strikingly if you do an experiment where you transplant somatic nuclei whose uh, linker histone is uh, marked in green, you can hardly see most of them, but these are examples of the somatic nucleus whose linker histones, the ones in between the nucleosomes, have been pre-marked with GFP. And we're putting these into an egg or oocyte in which the oocytes linker histones are marked in red fluorescent protein. They're red. You should see these uh, nuclei switching from green to red. And just to hopefully show that again. Uh, uh, yes, you, you should see most of the green nuclei rapidly losing the green and taking up the red. And uh, this uh, process happens amazingly quickly in, in two or three hours. Uh, 
which is a pretty quick time, and you can see one nucleus in green. That's one, interestingly, which, in which the cell membrane had not been permeabilized, so we'd actually transplanted a whole cell as opposed to a nucleus, and the egg materials can never enter a whole cell. They have, can only enter a nucleus. So that whole process um, happens remarkably quickly. In a matter of two or three hours, the, you can see that the uh, donor linker histone has essentially disappeared, and the oocyte's uh, own linker histone has now invaded these nuclei. And that is the first absolutely key uh, reprogramming event, this exchange of the linker histones within the chromatin. <clears throat> now, other events will soon occur. One of these um, is the, uh, this histone H3.3 again. That one is highly enriched in eggs and oocytes, high concentration, and after between 10 and 15 hours, almost all of the transplanted nuclei here or there have now taken up this uh, histone H3.3 and that uh, enhances the transcription of any genes which have been uh, opened up or made accessible. You can follow this at the individual levels of the various forms of RNA polymerase, including the uh, serine 5-phosphorylated form of polymerase 2, which is the elongating form of it. Uh, and again, there are several examples of loss of some components. The, um, uh, the, the polymerase component, RBP1, uh, disappears. The uh, H2B uh, is increased. Sorry, the slides are not very good. Uh, the tartar binding protein uh, is lost. I have to look at my screen. And, it, and it's replaced by the tartar binding protein of oocytes. So oh, and this shows the time course that almost as soon as the the histone B4, which is the linker histone changement exchange has occurred, the various forms of polymerase binding, um, activating, and elongating step in and start transcribing any gene they can, which has been made accessible. And this experiment is an alpha manita one, which uh, <coughs> uh, shows you that um, even if you use alpha manitin resistant somatic nuclei, which are the um, represented in effect by the blue, um, they, that, those alpha manitin resistant nuclei um, cannot um, contribute to the reprogramming if you use alpha manitin to suppress the oocyte's own uh, polymerase too. So with the uh, oocyte's contribution, you see a nice increase in transcription, activation of genes, which is uh, eliminated if you use alpha to kill the oocyte's um, own polymerase. Uh, now, this makes one other quite important point, and that is that the, <clears throat> the uh, decondensing or opening up of the chromatin of the transplanted nuclei uh, is done not at the linker histone invasion stage, the, this linker histone invades all nuclei, but it's the step of whether the polymerase can get access to the genes that decides whether a gene will be transcribed or not. So uh, this gene, SOX2, is one of the ones which is very strongly activated after uh, reprogramming, whereas it, globin is one of the ones that's not, and that simply shows uh, no, no such response. So one's beginning to be able to put in order the different events that occur as the egg reprograms nuclei. And we have a, a set of events here. Uh, and perhaps the most interesting thing is that this happens on a rather fast time scale. So at 17 degrees, one or one or one and a half days, already the somatic nuclei have been switched from the adult state, somatic state, back to the embryonic state. And this is um, putting together gradually a sequence of events by which the oocyte is uh, achieving this, what I call, attack on the somatic nuclei, trying to force them to be rejuvenated or reverse their differentiation. <clears throat>
So that brings us to the uh, step of <coughs> resistance to reprogramming. Uh, and as I said, the somatic cell nucleus is so set up that it's not meant to be sent backwards. It should not be reversed. And one remembers that in our brain, we don't have uh, intestine cells, and in our pancreas, we don't have uh, skin cells. So as development normally proceeds, there is a, a mechanism in development which means that gradually cells become increasingly stably uh, committed to their fate. Indeed, it would be, it's a good thing that's the case, because otherwise we'd have total confusion. So um, a process of cell differentiation does involve this stabilization, progressive stabilization of the differentiated state. To understand how that happens would, in my view, be immensely valuable, because if we knew what the basis of this stabiliza stabilization is, we could hope to reverse it and so make the whole process of reprogramming, whether by nuclear transfer or by IPS, a great deal more efficient. So now we're going to talk about resistance. <coughs> the first case in which we at least have some idea of what is happening is in the repressed X of female mammals, the inactive X, uh, where, as you no doubt know, genes are switched off, uh, really very stably. And the stability of this switch off is shown uh, if you transplant nuclei uh, from uh, mouse embryonic fibroblasts on day zero or even day three, there is essentially no reactivation, no uh, pluripotency gene, OCT4 transcripts, are just not seen at all. But if you use nuclei from the uh, uh, containing a repressed X, but from the epiblast, now the epiblast are the um, earlier embryo cells, they reverse very nicely indeed. And on day three, you've got a, a high degree of uh, reversal of this uh, inactive X. And I won't go into details, but I'll just tell you that the uh, answer to this problem is the molecule called macro H2A. And you can do experiments now by which you knock that down. And when you remove macro H2A, you find that these genes like OCT4 and SOX are nicely reactivated. So macro H2A helps to explain the resistance to reprogramming, at least in this case. So as the X becomes repressed, various things happen, and, and one important one is the, the invasion of the nucleus undergoing repression by this particular uh, molecule. <coughs> so macro H2A marks embryonic differentiation and acts as an epigenetic resistance marker. <clears throat> now, the next thing that's quite interesting to know is, is how many genes under, do in fact undergo reprogramming. And the diagram really tells you that um, uh, many genes don't change. The high-level expression continues in about uh, a quarter or so of the genes. The low-level, the repressed state, continues in about half. Some genes are switched off and some are switched on maybe up to 10% of genes are actually activated. So most genes don't change, but it enables us to uh, get a collection of genes which show strong activation uh, or strong repression, and so try to analyze the difference between these repressed states or these resistant states and uh, the activatable state of genes. <clears throat> And we now know that this resistance is both gene-specific, depends on the genes, and it depends on the cell type. So some cells will have a given gene in a resistant state and others in an activatable state, a useful situation for further analysis. Now, the <coughs> uh, one, one way forward is to study chromatin uh, modification, and all this says is that histone modifications in nuclei can indeed be changed. So if you um, use, uh, if you do an experiment where you inject messenger one day, transplant nuclei on day two, and then re-isolate the nuclei, 
day three for Western analysis, and if you've used uh, demethylases or deubiquitinases, you can effectively change back that uh, epigenetic state of the nuclei, uh, cancel it uh, after nuclear transfer. And when you do that, uh, you find that you have changed the epigenetic state of the transplanted nuclei. So uh, with no message overexpression, you can see methylation of the um, H3K9 ME3. And this is cancelled if you overexpress the uh, histone demethylase. <clears throat> and this uh, effect uh, is quite effective. So when you uh, do these experiments um, after using uh, demethylase, then the uh, HB heterochromatic protein 1 is eliminated. So functionally, you can change the state of these proteins by this route. And uh, when you do that, you can, in some cases, identify the nature of the epigenetic modification. So this is one where we happen to have used deubiquitinase and so there's a, a, a nil transcription on day zero, but after treatment of this you now activate transcription quite effectively. So that is <clears throat> again an indication of the kind of modification which accounts for this resistance. Uh, at least um, for some genes. Now, the ultimate way forward in this kind of work <clears throat> would be one in which you take uh, nuclei and you gradually remove components one at a time from them until such a time as you have removed, taken away resistance, thereby identifying the nature of the molecule con conveying this resistance. Now, this, um, in principle, can be done because you take these suspension of nuclei that we use and you treat them with salt or detergent to remove components and then transplant them. But we had a problem there because when you do that, the chromatin of the nuclei expands enormously into a thick gel and they're completely impossible to transplant. So it seemed like a, a complete blockage. But after a long, way, a long time, we found a way of encapsulating the nuclei in a kind of cage so that you can remove anything you want, and yet they will remain transplantable. And that was an important step forward. So when you do that, uh, you can, <clears throat> first of all, ask quite an important question. And that is, if you remove all the RNA from such nuclei, including non-coding RNA, every kind of RNA there is, uh, you can do that with ribonuclease, and you can reduce the amount of remaining RNA by five, that's a log scale, five orders of magnitude, so there is essentially none left. But if you add back message, uh, then you show you clean the nuclei and it doesn't get degraded. So the end result of that, for me, was very convenient because what it actually said is that Every kind of RNA, non-coding or not, makes no contribution to the resistance. W would have been an obvious candidate, but actually the RNA coming in with nuclei, whatever kind, simply doesn't have any effect. The resistance is not to do with RNA. So could it be to do with proteins? <clears throat> so you can take off quite a number of proteins with salt um, and triton uh, and then test them, again using this in vivo transcription system with the recurrent polymerase. And in some cases, uh, this, this works quite well. So we're looking at OCT4, the pluripotency gene OCT4. And when you use a treatment of salt to remove proteins, the gene is nicely reactivated, indicating that there are some components of that uh, nucleus which account for the resistance of OCT4. In a way, more interesting <coughs> is the opposite result. And um, this is what happens when you use high salt and detergent to remove proteins from nuclei. You can, uh, this is, these are ones with low salt or low salt, uh, higher salt, but high salt with triton. You remove almost all of the proteins from these transplantable nuclei and when you do that, the surprising result is that 
all of the candidate repressors you can think of make no contribution. So here we have the, uh, the usual uh, transcriptional activation or reprogram of ES cells, uh, and it's, uh, the C2C12 cells are resistant. And if you treat with no salt, low salt, middle salt, high salt, um, and with triton, uh, you can remove all these well-recognized repressors from the chromatin almost down to nothing, but in no case can you restore activation of these nuclei. They remain resistant to this very high salt concentration. And incidentally, if you continue that further to use pure DNA, the resistance um, uh, has, has then gone. So it's something to do with the proteins, um, remarkably salt-resistant proteins in these nuclei. And that's uh, the current direction of work, is to identify these very stable, long-lasting chromosome-associated proteins which are resistant to uh, salt removal, and we hope that that will continue to identify the basis of this resistance. So to summarize, this um, battle, as I call it, just to put this in perspective again, the egg, remember, is designed to transform sperm to an embryo-active nucleus. That's what eggs are specially designed for. And they try to do the same, when you put somatic nuclei in, and they do fairly well. But they can't do that completely, because the nucleus of a somatic cell is designed to do the opposite. It's designed to maintain the same pattern of gene expression, and therefore the nuclei try to resist any change. Hence this kind of battle for supremacy. supremacy. Now, just to look ahead, people will say, well, uh, what are you trying to do? And, and what we would like to do is to identify the molecular basis of resistance in order that these components can be removed and restore a somatic nucleus to uh, total, total reprogrammability. So they reprogram successfully, and we hope that that could be combined with the wonderful work of Shinya Yamanaka to greatly improve the efficiency of reprogramming using the natural components of the egg. And if that could be done, it should be possible to avoid the extensive proliferation of iPS-treated cells, which is often necessary to uh, achieve the full reprogramming activity. So our aim is, to, in a sense, to find out how does the egg do these things. So the prospect, in summary, as it were, is to defeat resistance and win what I call highly efficient cell replacement. And just to acknowledge the people in our group, we, we don't have a large group, but these are the ones marked who've been contributing to the work uh, that I have described. And a lot of previous colleagues, I won't, won't go through them uh, in, in detail, but some of the names may be familiar. Donald Brown, Ron Lasky, Doug Melton, Eddie Robertis, Lawrence Korn, and so on, have all been involved over the years uh, in this work. So thank you. End of talk. So you mentioned that the uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer required um, you to use a nucleus and an egg from the same species yes, in order for yes, this to work. Right, yes. But you would assume or you would think that um, this process being would be highly similar in all mm, species. Yeah. So mm. I'm just wondering, do you have any ideas what, mm. uh, why this would be required to be a yes, species? Yes, it's a very interesting question. We have done quite a lot of experiments of that sort. So um, if you transplant a mammalian nucleus into the egg, that's the one that undergoes division, it does very poorly, and DNA replication is, uh, is unsuccessful. However, um, you can do these experiments using a slightly more related species, like the so-called salamanders or newts. A nucleus, one of those, in the xenopus egg, uh, also arrests development fairly early, within a matter of hours, but interestingly, that is not due to the failure to reactivate early zygotic genes. Those turn on almost completely normally. 
but the embryo dies a bit later. And the reason it, it dies is because these well-known signaling processes, like the Speyman organizer and the Newcoop organizer, by which cells from one end of the embryo signal to the cells at the other end, um, depending on the signal molecules and the receptors. And the problem is that both of those processes are only 50% efficient. So the signaling works, but not very well. And the reception receptors work, but again, not very well. And so it makes the interesting general principle that the quantitative nature of these early cell interactions giving rise to an embryo are, are critical and have to be working at a high level of efficiency. So rather to my surprise, this, this cross-species combination is usually fails primarily due to the inefficiency of signaling processes. And they must have just become evolutionarily slight, enough different. And that factor of two is enough to stop things working. And in many other aspects of development, um, small quantitative differences are absolutely critical. So it's a good, a good question you ask. <laughs> OK. Uh, with this, I would like to thank our just one second. Oh, all right. <laughs> so Hold on a second. Uh, one right. more minute. With this, I would <laughs> like to thank you very much for taking your time, visiting us, and uh, giving such a wonderful lecture. And we decided to make this memorable for you as well, yes. to give you something to remember. And on the behalf <laughs> of Lund Step Cell Center, mm. uh, we decided that since you went ahead of time, to present you with head, and <laughs> this is the head, uh, which well. is made by famous uh, Swedish uh, uh. glass production oh, a company, uh, Costa Boda, oh. and it says that this is anti-stress object, <laughs> which you might need after this tough week of <laughs> entertainment, and for hand and eye, on the writing desk, on the bedside table, on the journey. Oh, so, you well. keep it on the journey, and yes. once you are back, you can well. put it either on your desk yes. or bedside. Uh, uh. And remember about your visit to Lund. I will indeed. And thank you, Focus. I often feel I need a new head, a new brain. So yeah. <laughs> it looks like Enjoy. it's uh, <laughs> have it available. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.